Long before pop stars toured the world in private jets, a choir from South Africa embarked on a tour of the United Kingdom and North America. The year was 1891, a time when South Africa was under British rule and facing dramatic changes from industrialization and political upheaval, as black leaders pushed colonial settlers for support to self-rule. The choir was made up of young, mission-educated black singers in their late teens and early 20s from the Eastern Cape. There were 14 members. Some of them, including Charlotte Manier and Paul Tuiniwe, later became important social activists and reformers in South Africa. The choir was joined by two kids who were relatives and two white agents. The purpose of the tour was to raise funds for a technical school in Kimberley, South Africa. At first, it was a big success. The choir performed to packed auditoriums filled in Britain. They sang in London's Crystal Palace and for Queen Victoria at Osborne House in the Isle of Wight. To gain support for their fundraising efforts, the choir had the tough job of creating a show that presented an Africa that was at once modern and unmistakably local, as one researcher put it. They sang South African indigenous songs, Western classical music, and Christian hymns. On stage, they performed the first half of the concert in African costumes that seemed designed to appeal to what British audiences thought South Africans should look like, not what they really wore. For example, the choir wore woolen blankets, which were European imports to Africa. A photo in a local London newspaper showed them posing with a tiger pelt, but tigers don't live in Africa. In the second half of the concert, they wore formal Victorian clothes. These costumes divided audiences in Britain and people who heard about them back home in South Africa. Despite the choir's popularity, tensions mounted as members fought about outfit choices, hidden political motives, and a rumored affair. The UK tour ended in 1893, after the agents mismanaged and likely stole money, leaving the singer stranded and without pay. A missionary society raised funds to bring the choir home, but they didn't stay in South Africa for long. Some members set out on tour again that year, this time to Canada and the United States. People flocked to hear them sing. The choir received praise in the press and again performed to packed houses. This tour didn't end well either, but some members stayed in the US to study at university, including Charlotte Manier, who was the first South African woman to earn a doctorate in arts and humanities. The story of the African choir was out of the spotlight for over a hundred years until a recent art exhibition featured rediscovered photos of their tour in Britain. Inspired by the striking photos, South African choreographer Gregory McOma and composer Tatuga Spizi are now sharing the choir's incredible story with the world in a new work, Broken Chord. Using traditional kosa and contemporary dance to thread the personal stories of the choir, Broken Chord reflects on the spiritual and political complications of colonialism. Looking at the black body as a political site, the work questions the relationship between the colonized and the colonizer and either complicity in shaping and shifting a South African narrative, past and present. The world tour of Broken Chord stops in Toronto for three nights only.